There are two ways to shoot time-lapse videos on the EOS R5, as well as actually most of Canon's most recent cameras. One is as an image sequence, that is a series of still images that you take at a regular interval that you then have to stitch together in post to make a video. The other uses the camera's built-in time-lapse video function. What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome back to some more tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. In this video, we are going to continue our dive into looking at time-lapse photography. Now, while some of the aspects of this video are specific to the EOS R5, such as the exact position something is found in the menus, or the exact resolutions of certain image formats, the techniques and broad procedures that I'm going to demonstrate in this video apply in one form or another to all of Canon's mirrorless and DSLR cameras. So, in my last video, which I have linked in the usual places, I looked at the concept and function of time-lapse photography as a creative endeavor, and kind of how to go about prepping to shoot one. This time we're going to start digging into the mechanical camera processes that are needed to pull those shots off. And specifically, this time we're going to look at the old-fashioned way of shooting a time-lapse by shooting a stead sequence of still images at regular intervals that is then combined in post into making a video. Now, I will point out that the post-processing is not covered in this video. I will be covering that in a future video in this sequence. Now, for shooting still sequences, we need an interval timer of some sort. With the R5 and any other camera that includes a remote release port, you can use an external intervalometer, such as this Canon TC-80N3. Now, on more modern cameras, including the R5 and all of the rest of the EOS R series, as well as many of Canon's latest DSLRs, these cameras also include a built-in software interval timer that you can use instead of an external one. So, which way should you go? What should you use? Well, if you're using the Canon TC-80N3, then there's no real difference between it and the internal software timer, at least for shooting time-lapse movies. Both have an optional 99-shot limit, and both can shoot indefinitely. Moreover, both have a minimum interval time of one second and a maximum interval time of 99 hours, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. So, the choice really comes down to, first, does your camera have the interval timer? If you're shooting an R5, then yes, it does. But if you're shooting on an older camera, maybe it doesn't. And second of all, convenience. Which one of these is a more convenient option for you in your situation? Now, either way, if you're going the still image route for time lapses, you have to make some decisions on image and camera settings. Now, considering that we're going to be shooting hundreds, if not thousands of frames, image format and shutter mode are worth taking a couple of seconds to think about. Now, on the R5 and similar cameras of its vintage, from Canon at least, the maximum image quality is delivered when shooting raw images using either the electronic first curtain or mechanical shutter modes. Now, since we're going to be shooting lots of images here, electronic first curtain puts the least amount of wear and tear on the shutter mechanism as it only cycles once per frame instead of twice as the mechanical mode does. Now, you could go fully electronic, and that will certainly save even more wear and tear on the shutter mechanism. But at least on the R5 and its immediate siblings, doing that runs the sensor in 12-bit mode instead of 14-bit mode, which can potentially cost you some image quality. However, the actual image quality, including dynamic range and all of the stuff that photographers like to stress over, is more complicated than just a single number. So don't necessarily assume that because you are doing a time lapse and you do want something that looks good, that you have to shoot in RAW and you have to shoot in 14-bit mode with the mechanical shutter or something like that to get an acceptable quality result. Remember, ultimately, this is going to be a video, not a still image. Now, as for image format, of course, shooting in RAW provides the highest dynamic range and the maximum possible image quality. But that does come at the cost of both larger file sizes and an increased in post-processing work because you will have to process all of those RAW files into something that you can actually composite into a video. 
Now, for me, between the size and extra processing, whenever I've shot time lapses using the still image approach, I have always opted to shoot JPEGs instead of RAW. And on top of that, since every camera I've used in the last 10 years has had a sensor that vastly exceeds the video resolutions that we are going to typically be targeting, I actually use one of the smaller JPEG options instead of shooting full size. So on the R5, S2 JPEGs are 2400 by 1600 pixels, and that's more than big enough for 1080p. In fact, it will downsample into 1080p. And S1 size JPEGs at 14, uh, 4176 by 2784 pixels are more than adequate for 4K. In fact, they will downsample into 4K. Finally, the People who want to shoot 8K, well, the full large size JPEGs on the R5 are sufficient for shooting 8K footage as well. Now, if you want more dynamic range in your image sequence than you would get with a JPEG and you don't want to go through all the work of RAW, a good choice is to turn on the HDR PQ settings so that you can make use of the HDR gamma curve and the HEIF file format. HEIF files on the R5 are, use the same resolution settings that you would set for the JPEG size options. So that's how you would change the size if you wanted to. And of course, they're gonna be 10 bit with a larger uh, dynamic range curve than what is supported in JPEGs. So you're gonna get a better quality image. Now, either way, I recommend, whether you're shooting RAW, JPEG, or HEIF, I recommend making a new folder for your time-lapse image sequences and a new folder for each sequence to keep them organized. Now, to do this on the R5, you have a couple of options. First, you can head over to the Setup 1 menu and then to the Recording Function plus Card slash Folder Selection entry at the top of that menu page. Then, scroll down to the bottom of that submenu to find the folder entry and select create folder. Now by default, this the camera will increment the three digit number that's prefixed to the word Canon. So for example, if your camera is on the first folder, it will be 100 Canon. When you do this, you will get 101 Canon. Your second option is to set up a custom button function to create the new folder on the button press. If you shoot time lapses frequently, this might actually be a really good solution. And of course you can combine it with the fact that custom button functions are saved specific to each of the custom shooting modes. So the C1, 2, and 3 modes as well to make sort of a time lapse custom shooting mode. That said, on the point of custom shooting modes, unfortunately, you cannot save the interval timer state, so enabled or disabled, in the custom shooting mode. Only the time setting and frame count will be saved, so this isn't quite going to be a one-button solution. Now, one final thing you might want to consider is cropping your images to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, primarily to aid in visualizing the composition of your shot. Now, keep in mind, if you're shooting JPEG or HEIF, the aspect ratio set by the Shoot 1 Crop Aspect Ratio menu entry will actually crop those images. If you are shooting in RAW, then the cropping is only applied at metadata, although you will see cropping indicators on the screen. Unfortunately, there is no way to have a 16 by 9 aspect bar while still shooting compressed JPEG or HEIF formats for composition, but not cropping the resulting file. Now, cropping the compressed images, especially if you're using the smaller sizes, isn't going to save you much space. Uh, but again, it will help with composition, and it's not that difficult to run into problems where you thought something was going to com be composed well in the 3x9 screen, and then, or 3x2 screen, and then when you go to 16x9, it just doesn't look right. The plus here is really about composition and speeding up post-production, since you've already got a 16x9 aspect image to start with. However, there is nothing inherently wrong with putting together a video that's 3 by 2 aspect and then cropping it to whatever output aspect you need it after you have assembled the video. So that takes care of the major camera settings. Now the last two things that I make sure I do is set my camera to single shot drive mode, not that continuous is a problem, and turn off autofocus. 
Now, if like me, you are a rear button autofocus user, then you do not have to worry about switching the lens to MF for this to be done properly. However, if you use your shutter release for focusing, then you will want to switch your lens to manual focus once you've set up your composition and focused for your video. If the camera has AF enabled, it will refocus before each image is released, so every time the interval triggers. And if the focus cannot be achieved, it will not release the shutter, which means that the camera will skip that image in your sequence. Now all that's left is setting up the interval timer and getting to shooting. So if you're shooting with an external timer like this Canon TC80N3, then the first thing you want to do is plug that into the remote release connector on your camera. Settings on the TC80N3 are split into three timers and a counter. The timers are self, interval, long, and the counter is frame. Now you step between these timers or settings by pressing the mode button on the TC80N3 and the currently selected timer or counter is indicated by an icon being displayed under the text label. Now if you want to add a delay to the start of your time lapse sequence, press the mode button until self is selected and the time icon is displayed under the self text. Then set the delay time you want. Now times are set by pressing in on the dial on the side of the re remote release, step to step through seconds, minutes, and hours respectively, and then rotating the dial when the respective element is selected to change it to the time you want. If you want the sequence to start immediately, make sure this is set to zero. Now do note this is a timer, it is not a time. So if you want the time lapse sequence to start at say six o'clock tonight, then you will have to figure out how many hours, minutes, and seconds are between when you're actually setting the timer and hitting start and when you want the sequence to start itself, you can't just plug in six o'clock. Next, we want to set the interval time. So to do this, we're gonna press the mode button until int is indicated by the alternating black and white the boxes being displayed below the int text. Then we're gonna set the interval time to the time that we need for our sequence. The shortest interval is one second, the longest interval is 99 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Now, I already talked in the previous video, again, I will put a link to it, about how to figure out interval, what interval time to use, and I gave some examples of some reasonable interval times that you might want to start with. Now, for the last two settings, long and frames, you're going to want these both set to zero for a time-lapse application. Long controls how long the remote release will hold down the shutter button, so it's effectively timed bulb exposure, and when it's set to zero, the intervalometer will just simulate pressing the shutter button instead of pressing and holding it. Finally, frames limits the total number of frames that the TC80N3 will shoot before it automatically stops. Now this would seem like it's a good idea or something that's useful, but since the limit is only 99 exposures, that's not gonna make much of a time lapse in practice. So when frames are set to zero, once the timer is started, the, it will continue until you press the start, stop button to stop it. Now, once the TC80N3 is set up to your liking and you've composed the scene the way you want it, press the start stop button on the remote to start the interval program running. When you have decided that you have shot a long enough piece of footage for your time lapse and ready to and you're ready to end it, press the start stop button again to stop it. So that's shooting a time-lapse sequence using the Canon TC80N3. And as I said, this will apply to any of Canon's cameras with a compatible remote release port. And actually, if your camera doesn't have an N3 port, so you can't use this specific timer, there are third-party interval timers on the market that use an almost identical interface to what Canon uses in their TC80N3. However, if you are shooting with a reasonably modern EOS R camera or even DSLR, there is also a built-in software intervalometer right in the menus, so you don't even need to worry about hooking something up. Now for the EOS R5, you will find this at the top of the Shoot 6 menu page under the aptly named Interval Timer Entry. Setup for this is in many ways a lot easier than it was for the external timer since there aren't as many things to deal with. Simply head into the Shoot 6 menu, select the interval timer, and then select Enable to get started. 
Once the timer is enabled, we can configure the interval and number of shots, first by pressing either the physical info button on the back of the camera or the info detail set virtual button on the LCD. This will bring up a menu where you will find only two options, interval and number of shots. To use the interface here, you can tap any field you want to use to select it or use the rear dial or left and right on the joystick to highlight it in red. To change a value, you can use either the virtual up down arrows, up and down on the multi-controller, or the rear dial to change the selected field. If you're using the physical controls instead of the virtual buttons, then you'll have to push set to select the selected text box to allow you to edit it. Now, like the TC80N3, the allowed range for the interval is one second to 99 hours, 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Once you've set the interval you want, next set the number of shots to zero. When you do this, the text will read unlimited just below the counter. When the interval timer is active or enabled, you will see the text timer appear in the live view display. If you've set a frame limit, then the number of frames remaining will also be displayed to the right of that timer icon. At this point, the camera is ready to shoot with the interval timer. Finalize your composition and press the shutter release to start the interval timer shooting. While the timer is running, pressing the shutter release will take an additional picture. To stop the timer, you can either go back into the menus and set it to disabled if the timer interval is long enough for you to do that, or turn the camera off via the power switch. The timer will automatically stop running if you have a frame count set and the frame re limit is reached. Now, one thing to be aware of, the interval timer will automatically be disabled if the camera is power cycled. However, the timer is not disabled if auto power down timeouts are reached or the LCD turns off automatically. Now, whether you're using the internal or external interval timer, neither of these receive any feedback from the camera about the status of the exposure it's making. This means that if an exposure fails or a previous exposure is still in progress, then the newly dispatched exposure will not be captured. So you have to make sure that your interval time is longer than the longest exposure time that you might end up with in whatever you are shooting. That, and there aren't any other processes that could hold things up, which is why we turned off autofocus earlier. So that's how to go about shooting a time lapse with a still sequence using either an internal or external interval timer. If you found this useful, let me know by hitting the like button and sharing this. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you're not already. Also, if you'd like to directly support this channel in future videos like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can, or buying yourself some gear from the affiliate links in the description. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.